<laughs> so, Quantin Uiti Quantin. I defined continuity yesterday, and I think I said this out loud, but if I didn't, let me say it out loud now, that most everyday functions are continuous on their domain. So continuity for our purposes is kind of the default. It's unusual to have discontinuities. And I was at the end of class yesterday, I was listing continuous functions. And I said that polynomials were continuous and just. Briefly, let's remind ourselves what this means. Being continuous at a point means the limit as x approaches c of the function can be gotten just by plugging c in for x. And this is continuity at a point. We're talking about continuity on domains here. So this statement is true, assuming that C is in the domain of the polynomial. And all polynomials have all the real numbers as their domain. So that's not an issue here. Every polynomial is continuous at every point. Also continuous on their domain are rational functions. And let's briefly remind ourselves, a rational function is a polynomial divided by a polynomial. And here, the restriction that we're talking about continuity on the domain matters. With the polynomials, it didn't, because the domain was every real number. Rational functions are continuous on their domain, but they can have points of discontinuity, that kind of awkward, language thing, and that's, I'll come back to this function, but something like x plus one divided by x, x plus two divided by x minus two. There is a value where this rational function is not continuous at x equals two, it's not defined, so it cannot be continuous. But everywhere this function is defined, it is continuous. So that's what we're saying when we talk about continuity on the domain. And at the, now we're just going to have basically a big list of functions. I've said that all of the day-to-day -day functions we work with are continuous on their domains. So let's go through these. All six trig functions. 
So the sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, cotangent. Those are all continuous on their domains. And again, that on their domains part of the phrase is significant. Um, if we go back to Desmos, Sine of x is defined everywhere and it's continuous everywhere. And the cosine of x is defined everywhere and it's continuous everywhere. The tangent of x is not defined everywhere. It has all of these vertical asymptotes set pi divided by two, for example. So because the tangent isn't defined at pi divided by two, it certainly can't be continuous at pi divided by two, but where it is defined, it is continuous. And all of the other trig functions have similar properties. The secant also has these vertical asymptotes where it's not defined, but where it is defined, it's continuous. The cotangent and the cosecant are the same. So we're not, we're not going to do anything or we're not going to do a lot with the inverse trig functions in calculus one. For various reasons, these things get studied in calculus two instead. Be that as it may, they are continuous on their domains. I'll just mention these where we're not going to study them most likely. And it's possible that some of you have never even heard of them. I don't know if they get talked about in pre-calculus, but if you've seen the hyperbolic trig functions, those are continuous on their domains. If you haven't seen them, don't worry about it. Moving on to stuff that you have seen. The exponential functions are all continuous on their domain. So like, the exponential function we're going to really use in calculus is f of x equals e to the x, and that's continuous. I say it's continuous on its domain, which is a perfectly true and valid statement. The domain of the exponential function is all of the real numbers. So the exponential function is continuous everywhere. If you want to take its limit, you just plug C into the exponential. Since we've mentioned exponential functions, let's mention their inverses next. Logarithmic functions are continuous 
on their domains. And this time the on their domains part of that sentence matters because the logarithmic functions have values that aren't in their domain. So if you look, say, at the natural logarithm, but any logarithm has this property, it's only defined when x is positive. The natural logarithm of zero is not defined. So if it's not defined at zero, it can't be continuous at zero. But everywhere it is defined, it is continuous. You see, we don't have any of that jumping about features we saw when we were looking at discontinuous graphs yesterday. And maybe I'll just scroll it at the bottom of this frame. Power functions all power functions are continuous on their domain. And again, that require on this time the on their domain stuff. Let me even write it down. That condition matters because power functions might or might not be defined everywhere. It depends on the power x to the one-third, that's a power function that's defined everywhere. It's continuous everywhere. x to the negative one-third, let's zoom in so we can see this, is not defined at zero. It has a it has a vertical asymptote at zero. So you see it's undefined. If it's not defined at a point, it can't be continuous at a point. But everywhere that it is defined, it's continuous. Once again, we don't see any of that jumping around in the graphs that was a feature of discontinuous functions. In fact, this is basically probably every function you've ever studied practically. Um, am I missing anything? Abs I won't bother to write this down. We won't use it in this class. Absolute value functions are continuous. Um, everything that we're used to dealing with is continuous. It might be a more interesting question to ask. And I give a standard example of a discontinuous function. That is, I can create discontinuous functions by messing around with piecewise definitions and stuff. But are there e any easy to understand standard functions that are discontinuous? Now well, we've already seen one, the heavy side function is a standard example of a discontinuous function. 
It has a <coughs> jump that characterizes these things. And the other example that you might have seen at some point, depending on your background, This is called the floor function. And what the floor function does is take any decimal and round it down. So Here's another classic example of a uh, piecewise defined, no, sorry, not piecewise defined. Here's another classic example of a function with discontinuities. If we have never seen this thing, maybe we should. Do doesn't like that. Here's the floor function. So you see numbers between zero and one are rounded down to zero. Numbers between one and two are rounded down to one, and so on. And this function has discontinuities. It's discontinuous at one, it's discontinuous at two, it's discontinuous at three, and so on. So it is certainly possible to write down functions that are not continuous on their domains, but the functions we are most used to working with, these are, eight classes of functions. These are all continuous on their domains. So any questions? I know I sort of went through that. It's hard to know how to slow down when you're just presenting a list though. So we have a bunch of functions that are continuous, but most day-to-day -day functions aren't going to exactly be the functions on the lists. Like when you take pre-calculus or trigonometry and you talk about the sine and the cosine, you see functions that look like this. A constant times the sine of a linear expression plus another constant. And this function is built of continuous functions. The sine is continuous. 5x minus 2 is continuous. The constant function 2 is continuous. And the constant function 7 is continuous. But does all of that make f of x continuous? Does being built from continuous parts make a function continuous? The answer to that question is yes. So sums and differences and products of continuous functions 
are also continuous. And once again, when we say the word continuous, what we mean is continuous on the domain of the function. And you might notice, I mean, I have addition, subtraction, multiplication here. I didn't write down anything about division, but but this is true of quotients. If you have a continuous function, you divide it by another continuous function, the result is continuous. I wanted to give this as a separate bullet point and talk about it separately, because here, once again, the phrase continuous which really means continuous on the domain of the function, is doing some lifting. If you have the function f of x equals something, sorry if you undo that. If you have the function f of x, equals x plus one. This is continuous everywhere. It's continuous from negative infinity to positive infinity. And that's because x plus one is a polynomial and this is a property polynomials have. It was number one on that list we gave. G of X equals X minus one. This is also a polynomial. It's also continuous everywhere, from negative infinity to positive infinity. H of x equals f of x divided by g of x is not continuous on this interval. It's not continuous from negative infinity to positive infinity because it's not continuous at one. <laughs> Sorry, I'm busy spell, give me a moment. It's not defined at one, so it can't be continuous at one. But if you get rid of these intervals, if you just make the observation that f of x is continuous on its domain, and g of x is continuous on its domain, then h of x is also continuous on its domain. So remember when we talk about continuity without any qualifying statements, we're talking about continuity on the domain of the function. This, is contin this being h of x is continuous everywhere it's defined. So that's all well and good. What I have here isn't a product or a sum or a quotient or a difference. It has elements of being all of those things. 
But the sine of five X minus two is what? No takers. The sine of five X minus two is a composition. Remember that if you have one function inside of another, that's a composition. And here we have five X minus two inside the sine of X. So we need, if, if we want to claim that f of x is continuous, well, the sine is continuous and 5x minus 2 is continuous. What we need is a statement that the composition of continuous functions is continuous. And we do have this statement. I didn't just write it on the board for kicks. This is true. Compositions are continuous. And we finally have everything we need to claim that this is continuous. This composition is continuous because the sine and 5x minus 2 both are. This addition, the composition is continuous and the constant function 7 is continuous. So their sum is continuous. This multiplication, the constant function two is continuous and the sine is continuous. So their product is continuous. We have this function built up of continuous functions and it is therefore continuous. And unless you're intentionally trying to create um, a function with discontinuity, is basically any function you write down is going to be continuous. Because basically any function you write down is going to be built from these building blocks. So, I mean, I can write down something very complicated. The cubed root of the sine squared of x minus the logarithm of x plus two times x times the exponential of x all divided by the tangent of x minus x to the one third power. I mean, just intentionally making kind of the ugliest function I can but it's still built out of totally continuous pieces. The sign's continuous, so's the logarithm, so's 2x, so's e to the x, so's the tangent of x, so's x to the one third power. And we're adding and subtracting and squaring and perform, uh, so's the cubed root of x wouldn't want to leave that out. Um, the cube root of x is a power function, remember. It's x to the one third. So we have this very ugly function, but it's built out of continuous pieces. 
using addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and composition. So this function without having to really give it any thought, this function is continuous. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Let's do the examples and the problems, like the quiz problems that we see in these sections tend to be pretty artificial, but I like them anyway, because they bring together so many different concepts. Continuity and limits and left-hand limits and right-hand limits. So we can review all of the stuff we've done recently with the following example. That G of X be the piecewise defined function. That's X plus the sign of X when X is less than or equal to zero. X squared plus six X plus nine. What am I doing? Okay, this is fine. When X is greater than zero, this isn't quite what I wanted. Let's mess around with this a little. X squared plus k when x is greater than zero. And let's ask, is there any value of k? Hey, that makes this function continuous. So let's pause to sort of let's step back. Let's step away from the specific values um, in particular. And let's just sort of try to understand the question. X plus the sign of X is a continuous function. X is continuous. The sign is continuous. It's built from continuous functions. X squared plus K is continuous. It's quadratic, it's a polynomial. But this is a piecewise defined function. And the point of this question is that if here is zero, you could have one continuous chunk of a piecewise defined function, and you could have another continuous chunk. And even though both of these pieces are continuous, when you put them together, there's a jump. And so the resulting function is not continuous at the joint where the pieces meet. 
So going back to here, x plus the sine of x is continuous, x squared plus k is continuous, but at zero, where these two continuous pieces get sort of joined together, there could be a jump. And what we're really asking here then, is there any value of k that makes this thing continuous at to zero? It's continuous everywhere else, definitely. Just because these two pieces are continuous, but when we join them together, the result might not be continuous. Let's in fact look at this explicitly. X plus the sine of X, X squared plus K. So here's the graph of our function. And you see for the value of k that that's most defaulted to, which is k equals one, there is a discontinuity at zero. The function jumps. If we mess around with k, we can move these pieces around. And we're looking for a value of k so that there's no jump. And of course, graphically, we've just solved the problem, it looks like. When k is zero, these two pieces just fit cleanly together. But let's try to do this analytically. That is, let's try to do this by looking at formulas and taking limits and seeing if we can replicate this graphical result. So what's it mean specifically? to be continuous at zero. Well, first of all, the function has to be defined at zero. So let's see, zero is less than or equal to itself. So we're in this chunk. And g of zero is defined then. g of zero is zero plus the sine of zero. And depending on how how well your unit circle trigonometry has survived from pre-calculus to this. You can either type this into your calculator or you can do it in your head. But the sine of zero is zero, so this sum is zero. So check. G of zero is defined. The limit as X approaches zero of G of X must exist. And here's where I said this sort of this material was nice 
because it lets us review old material as well. Here's where we're going to review one-sided limits. It's very hard to just look at this piecewise defined function and make statements about the limit as x approaches zero. And that's because when you take a limit as x approaches zero, it's not supposed to matter which side you approach zero from. But we've got this piecewise defined function. If you're approaching zero from the left, you're in the first piece. If you're approaching zero from the right, we're in the second piece. So if we're taking the limit as x approaches zero, which of these functions do we use? There's no answer to that. Question. It depends on which side we're approaching from. If we remember, however, that the limit exists, if the left hand limit and the right hand limit are the same, that complication goes away. Taking the left-hand limit is straightforward. If we're to the left of zero, we're using that piece. So I know I keep here. In fact, let me, uh, let me clear off this frame and we can we can work here. Let me also wait, I didn't want to erase that. What I wanted to do was take this and copy it to the previous frame. The limit as x approaches zero of g of x exists. Okay, if you've never seen this notation, you might as well see it now. If and only if, I haven't just forgotten how to spell, IFF is a mathematical abbreviation for if and only if. This limit exists if and only if the, the one-sided limits are the same. <laughs> And finding the one-sided limits is straightforward, which, I mean, isn't the same as being easy if you haven't seen this material before. I just mean that it's not going to take a lot of steps. If we're approaching zero from the left, we're in the first piece, <coughs> x is negative. So if we're approaching zero from the left, g of x is x plus the sine of x. Now, what makes this straightforward is that x is continuous and the sine of x is continuous. And remember when I told you that taking one-sided <coughs> limits is just like taking two-sided limits? That goes for continuity as well. 
So to take this limit, we just plug zero in there. And again, either mentally or via calculator, this limit is zero. But does the left-hand limit equal the right-hand limit? Well, moment of truth here. If we're approaching zero from the right, X is positive, and we're in this piece. X squared plus K. Once again, X squared plus K is continuous. It's a polynomial. We can take this limit by plugging zero in. And the left hand, sorry, the right hand limit is K. So this limit exists if and only if the one-sided limits are the same. In other words, this limit exists if and only if k equals zero. And solving for k is exactly what we were trying to do. We're not quite done with the problem yet. Let me put a question mark in front of that. Um, if k equals zero doesn't work, the answer is just no. K is the only value that could possibly make this continuous because K is the only value that makes this limit exist. <clears throat> but there's a third condition that has to be satisfied, right? In fact, the important condition. Which is that this limit and this value at zero have to be the same. So what is this limit if k is zero? Well, remember that the one-sided limits, if the one-sided limits are the same, then they equal the two-sided limits. So if k is zero, the one-sided limits are equal, they're both zero. So this two-sided limit also equals zero. And the limit equals the value. Let me at least scroll something about that in my notes. The limit equals the value. So this is a statement of continuity, that the limit as x approaches zero of g of x is also what you get if you take zero and stick it into the function. <laughs> and this problem, let me, let me remove that question mark. 
and circle our answer. K equals zero causes this function to be continuous. And again, we had, this isn't a surprise, we had investigated this graphically as well and observed that K equals zero causes there not to be any jump at this joint. Any other value of K causes a discontinuity. And that's, um, that's it for this section. You should be able to do the quiz on this. Um, so those are due Saturday as usual. As always, if you have any questions, like someone, uh, someone noticed in one of the quiz questions that two of the answers were the same, I fixed that when it was pointed out. So if you have any questions, if you see anything like that, just let me know and I'll either answer your questions or fix the problem.